The two federal officials during this era most responsible for improving black, rural, and southern health were uh, Surgeon General Thomas Perrin and Oscar Ewing, head of the Federal Security Agency. After the Depression ravaged the South, causing increased rates of death and disease, Surgeon General Perrin, as, as we saw earlier, said the South is the nation's number one health problem. He also declared war on venereal disease, calling it the shadow on the land. You couldn't say syphilis on the radio until he said it in 1935. Um, he focused control efforts on the rural black and southern populations where VD rates remained highest. He also happened to be the Surgeon General who was in charge during the early years of the Tuskegee syphilis study. Um, during World War II, Perrin urged black women to join the Cadet Nurses Corps and black men to join the Army Medical Corps. So he really did advocate for the inclusion of blacks as professionals as well as patients. Oscar Ewing earned a reputation as the man doctors hate. The American <coughs> Medical Ed Association, he was their number one public enemy. Um, because he was so passionate in advocating national health insurance. Um, it's too easy to... Uh, okay. Um, so this is Oscar Ewing. Um, the National Medical Association, by the way, is the association of black physicians. Because while northern physicians could get into the AMA, the local societies in the south would not admit blacks, and you had to be affiliated with the local society. So southern black physicians couldn't get in the AMA. Um, so writing the Journal of the National Medical Association, Oscar Ewing is talking about eliminating racial health disparities 50 years before that really starts to get a lot of traction uh, in, in, in our era. Um, the National Medical Association called the Federal Security Agency, which was the, it became HEW, it was the umbrella agency for the Department of Education, Social Security, uh, and Public Health Service. The FSA was the most liberal federal agency, and it praised Ewing for his efforts to advance opportunities for black physicians in the public health service, and to enable black medical students from Howard University to serve as residents at Gallinger Hospital, a federal, federal facility in Washington, D.C. And when Ewing did that, uh, the, the Southern Segregationist congressmen just screamed like murder. They, they were very upset about that. Um, legislation for a comprehensive national health program also began in 1938. The Wagner-Murray-Dingle National Health Bill uh, would, would be based on this and, and debated throughout the Roosevelt and Truman administrations until it finally died in 1953. So the, the era of national health insurance cuts off right before Brown is decided. Um, at the same time, the South's most progressive and influential national politicians, Claude Pepper and Lister Hill, entered the Senate uh, to pursue a South-centered federal health policy that would channel resources to address the region's urgent shortages of doctors and hospital beds. Pepper and Hill both served on the Senate Subcommittee on Health, and with the support of the American Hospital Association, Surgeon General Perrin, and most national black organizations, they formed a political coalition that aligned liberal New Dealers, the Southern Bloc in Congress, organized medicine, and pragmatic black medical activists. Where else do you see that combination of allies? Nowhere. Um, so this is their plan. Uh, there was you know, support for public health, um, support for medical education and research, uh, for sanitation, for indigent medical care, for hospital construction, um, and for the rehabilitation of all those uh, World War II draft uh, rejects. So, um, it was a really comprehensive national health program, and it was you know, very much engineered by these progressive Southern senators, Lister Hill and Claude Pepper. Far more federal and state funding was available for constructing hospitals after the Hilbert Hospital Survey and Construction Act was passed in 1946 uh, than for schools. But the more expensive nature of health care 
drove Southern policymakers to consider providing health services to blacks and whites within single facilities that use the same personnel and technical resources to care for patients on racially separate wards. This presented black activists with a painful dilemma. Should they pursue an equal share of this new funding to meet the urgent health needs of Southern blacks, or should they press for the ideal of full integration by sacrificing the benefits of inclusion within modern, biracial, but internally segregated institutions? <coughs> Wilburton's passage was dependent on the fragile agreement to pursue inclusion without integration in federal health policy, which promised parity in facilities and services for blacks in segregated areas. Contrary to most scholars' interpretations of Hilburton's separate but equal clause, it was not proposed by Southern segregationists, but rather by black civil rights leaders, particularly physicians in the National Medical Association. The NMA's chief lobbying concern for most of the 1940s was not dismantling segregation, but rather protecting the right of black physicians to admit their patients to these new government-funded health facilities. Although the 1946 Hilburton Act did not ban all forms of racial discrimination against patients and health professionals as NAACP Chair Lewis Wright and other integrationists had hoped. Its provision for federal enforcement of racial parity in health programs was the first national victory uh, for blacks in, in any federal legislation since Reconstruction. Um, this gives you an idea of how much money went into building hospitals, and uh, this is nationwide, by the way, and how many projects were built. Um, Southern cities made hospitals a top priority for federal works programs. The PWA alone added nearly 8,000 new beds in all black hospitals or wards in 17 southern and border states. This trend of channeling federal resources to the South was formalized and applied to an even greater degree under Hill Burton. Increased federal funding for hospital construction, supplemented by state appropriations and local bond issues, shifts the balance of new hospital beds toward publicly owned facilities. Though most hospitals continue to operate with, uh, on a voluntary model with boards comprised of private citizens. So it's not that the government is completely operating these hospitals, but the governments do own the hospitals. And that's important uh, once we get to the 64 Civil Rights Act. <coughs> 